Stephen uh, Lomazo, who is an avid collector of magazines, and he is going to share some uh, uh, history moments in, in the history of American magazines and things that are. Uh, and I thought I collect magazine, and I spend a lot of magazine. Like I mentioned in the last conference, that my tax receipts alone for last year were like thirty-eight thousand uh, dollars buying magazines in 2018. Uh, the good doctor has spent $39,000 buying one issue of one magazine this week. So he's loaded. We need to take, we need to take good care of him. I mean, I, I, I can see it, like the, the Dr. Stephen Lomazo Magazine Museum, the Samir Hosni Collection. <laughs> Donations. Uh, the larger the donation, the bigger the name will be on the wall. So, <laughs> so please welcome with me, uh, Dr. Magazine, aka Dr. Magazine. Can anybody hear me? Or how's the level? You hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. Well, I want to thank Samir for bringing me down to this lovely city. Uh, we actually came together uh, at the, uh, believe it or not. By, by a fellow by the name of Charles Overby, for whose this building was dedicated. Uh, Mr. Overby ran a museum in Washington. When they opened up, I, they, they wanted to do the history of journalism, and they wanted to come to somebody who had newspapers and magazines. They found two people to get newspapers, and they came to me for my magazine. So a lot of these magazines that you're seeing today were on display at the museum. Now, hopefully the collection will do better than the museum did, because they're about to close. But um, anyway, people ask me what about my collection. I've been doing this since 1974. My, my private collection, I have, I have a website, uh, AmericanMagazineCollection.com. There are 7,000 images on it. You can search it with, for any particular genre you like. The collection encompasses everything important in a magazine from the very beginning to very recently. So if, if, it, if, it, if it happened in a magazine and it's important, that's what I'm interested in collecting. And over the years, you meet a lot of wonderful people in magazines. And you'll see about a few of them tonight. I chose this talk because it, it's a bit, I did this for a New York, uh, New York Military Affairs Symposium, uh, a bunch of uh, history wonks, military history wonks in 2012. And they liked it, so I figured you were too. But war is interesting because we're, war is perpetual. Uh, <laughs> People still fight with each other, so and it's also a very good way of looking at periodicals and how they affected, how they reflected history, and how they drove history. So let's talk about magazines. Okay, who can tell me where the word magazine came from? Okay, I like the no. Okay, magazines have a military uh, connotation because they, if you think about going on the, where they store the the uh, ammunition on a ship, that was called the magazine. It's a storehouse. And, and in 1731, uh, this fellow who was who went by the name of Sylvanus Irvin in Britain published the Gentleman's Magazine. And he was the first one to use the uh, uh, word magazine in the context of a storehouse of information. And that's where it came from. Uh, American magazines began in 1741. And these are not from my collection. They're very rare. I've never seen a copy for sale. They're sort of all over the place. Uh, in various institutions, Harvard has one, and Yale has one, and Princeton has another. And somebody put them together into a run, but there's no known run of these. They're very rare. And you'll see the one on the right was published by a fellow by the name of Benjamin Franklin. He was actually beat to the press by this fellow who, who stole his idea and, uh, and, and scooped him by three days. That was the name of the whoops, there goes my sound. His name was, it's uh, Bradford. Is there a for that? Gotcha, okay. His name was Andrew Bradford. So magazines, these were the only two, first two magazines in America. <clears throat> 1743, the first religious magazine came in, and then we've got the first successful magazine in America called the, believe it or not, the American Magazine. Now, you can see that this was the first successful magazine in America published between 1743 and 1746. 
That is the first map ever published in an American magazine. It's actually a battle map of the city of Louisburg. And it, there's a lot of history involved in the battle of the, there was a war of uh, something. And, <laughs> and uh, the, the war was settled by the, uh, by the, in 1748 by the Treaty of the Elysian Cup. But what you see up on top is a gorgeous engraving of the city of Boston in 1745. And as you also can see that the magazine was sold in Philadelphia by Benjamin Franklin. Um, let's skip to the next war, which is the French and Indian War. And this is uh, a magazine, no magazine was, well, first there was magazines published in 1753, but then this one came on in 1758. And this is the only magazine published during the French and Indian War. What you're looking at here is the first political cartoon in America. And what you can see, I don't think I have a pointer here, but you can see that there's a British uh, a fellow on the left and a Frenchman on the right, and the Brit British guy is treating the Indians nicely, and the Frenchman is, is treating the Indians poorly. <laughs> so uh, uh, the, the, uh, the motto of the magazine is, uh, translates to uh, the more, the more equitable will prevail. So this is an advertisement for the British and anti-French. What's the circulation of these titles? These magazines would have a circulation of 500, maybe 1,000. Mm -hmm. um, not a lot. Remember, magazines, the history of printing, the history of magazines, the, the first magazines were, 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 were printed in a city where the guy would, love, would be the first person to lug a printing press and paper over the mountains to print it. So it, it, it's not only the history of magazines, it's the history of printing. And of course, getting the paper and getting the ink is another issue. Um, now let's get to the, to, the, to the big one, the Revolutionary War. This magazine uh, was one of, the, one of the most important stimuli for American liberty. And it was published between 1774 and 1775. And you will see that the engravings are done by a uh, fellow by the name of Paul Revere. Um, he was a, a silversmith, a uh, very good engraver, and in 1865, he really had somewhat lost the history until 1861 when Henry Wadsworth Longfellow wrote a poem in the Atlantic magazine called The Midnight Ride of Paul Revere. And that, that made Revere into an icon. Before that, he was, he was an anecdote in history. So magazines could make people and break people, and, and, and Longfellow made Revere. But he was an excellent engraver, and these are original engravings. Uh, well, a lot of the engravings you think were reprinted from British magazines, but these obviously are original. And these are the two great patriots of the Revolution, Sam, John Hancock and Samuel Adams. The one on top is a re-engraving. This was a British magazine, but it was redone and re-engraved by Paul Revere. And you can see that the man is looking up the dress of, uh, of America and Boston cannonaded it. This, this, the, 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 uh, this is not an original. They changed some of the words around, but this is re-engraved by Revere. In 1776, a magazine came out called Pennsylvania Magazine, which was published by the famous Thomas Penny. And this engraving in that magazine is a contemporary view of the Battle of Bunker Hill. Thomas Paine's Pennsylvania Magazine was the only magazine printed in 1775 and 1776. People, the, the last issue was July 1776, which, which published the only magazine to publish the Declaration of Independence contemporarily. But the really interesting thing about this magazine is it wasn't public, they weren't published till the end of the month, sometimes till the next month. And there was this little news thing in the back of the magazine. And this is fascinating because this is the, the, the June issue, this is from the June issue. This, that's, that's just, this is the one that says, this is the, the one that you see on the bottom is this, the issue which has the Declaration of Independence. But the June issue noted that it wasn't published until July the 2nd. And the news of the day on July 2nd, John Hancock, President, this day the Honorable Continental Congress declared the United Colonies free and independent states. This is the first mention of independence anywhere printed. The Declaration of Independence, of course, wasn't published until later. The broadside, they, they, they hammered it up on, on the wall in front of, on, on the wall in front of uh, Independence Hall, and it really wasn't circulated until later. The first 
printed newspapers that were about July 6th or July 7th. And it wasn't, a lot of them didn't sign until much later. But, so this is actually the first mention of, of liberty, of, of the United States. Um, there's a lot of history in magazines. This is probably the first great literary work published in an American magazine. And it happened to be published by an African-American woman by the name of Phyllis Wheatley, who was a poetess. She was a free black. She had been freed. She was incredibly literate. And this is her ode to George Washington. Uh, uh, this is actually the first piece of original literature ever published in an American magazine. It was published by a black ex-slave, Phyllis Wheatley. And she is an icon. And this is her poem to George Washington. Um, those days, there was no television, there was no radio. So you, didn't, you couldn't figure out who, what people looked like. So you, you saw them in magazines. These, these are from the 1780s. There's Dr. Franklin in a magazine called the Boston Magazine. And of course, there's about maybe five or six or seven contemporary engravings of George Washington. So if you passed him, you know what he looked like. The first magazine devoted to strictly to uh, to uh, um, military affairs was published in 1796, called the Monthly Military Repository. Now remember, magazines are periodical. So what is a periodical? A periodical is something that's published periodically. So a newspaper is a daily, theoretically. So newspapers are not considered per periodicals. Uh, annuals and almanacs. They're not considered periodicals either. So anything published, you can make a case for anything published weekly, bi-weekly, monthly, bi-monthly, quarterly. Those are magazines. But daily newspapers are not magazines. So as you can see, there's a wonderful engraving of George Washington here. He didn't die until 1799, so this is while well, he was still alive. Then we go to the War of 1812. This is the first magazine published contemporarily for a war. And this was published. Uh, in New York, which was a major printing center and remained the major printing center in America and still is. Uh, there's a lot of magazines published in Boston and Philadelphia, but New York over the years has been the predominant uh, center for printing. Uh, now, of course, in the British magazines, um, they, uh, they, they, print, they, print, they printed this image, which is the and you'll see the caption, the president's house in Washington, lately taken and destroyed by the British Army. This is the first printed image of the White House, printed in a British ladies' magazine in October 1814, showing how the British burnt down the White House. Now, probably the, the most, one of the, probably the most important magazine of the second decade of the 18th, uh, 19th, 18th century, 19th century, was this one called the Analectic Magazine. It was, edited, it was actually edited by a fellow by the name of Washington Irving, who you might remember from this little legend of Sleepy Hollow, who was one of the great literary figures in America. But in their October, November of 1814 issue, they published a poem. You can see what it says here. Look, uh, the gentleman in, in had, had was, watched the flag and was very inspired to write this poem, and they called it defensive. Ford McHenry. It had been published in three local newspapers before this, but this is the first national printing. By now, this is probably a, a, a circulation of three or 4,000. Now, this is in its original state, the original wrappers, which are very hard to find. Normally, when they would bind them up, they'd, they'd rip these things off and put them in the bound volume. So it's hard to find in the original volume. That's what it looked like originally when it was first printed. And of course, this poem, which was about six or eight stanzas, became the you know, Star Spangled Banner. And here is what it looked like in the magazine. It's, it's, uh, the tune is Anacreon in Heaven, which is an old British drinking song. <laughs> uh, now we're going to the Mexican War, and the graphics get a lot better because the printing got better and, and the engraving got better. And this magazine was published during the Mexican War. And the interesting thing about this was um, there was a there was a humor uh, a series of, of uh, humorous articles printed about, printed about Zachary Taylor called Authentic Anecdotes of Old Zach, and this was the first work printed by a fellow by the name of Herman Melville, who later wrote a book about a whale. And these are some of the early political cartoons from from the uh... now Yankee Doodle. It is interesting. 
Uncle Sam, Yankee Doodle, Brother Jonathan. Those are the, you know, Britain, the British was always represented by John Bull, but America was always represented today, you think of Uncle Sam. But actually, Uncle Sam didn't become the American symbol until late, until the late, late, late 1890s. And of course, the famous image we'll see in World War I, the James Montfort Montgomery flag did. Before that, America was Brother Jonathan, because, uh, because it was named after a Connecticut patriot by the name of Jonathan Trumbull, because George Washington wanted something done, and his six quarters saying, Brother Jonathan will do it, and Brother Jonathan became known as the, as the American symbol. And there's magazines called Brother Jonathan. So let's get into the beginnings of the Civil War. Obviously, it was about a lot of things, uh, slavery being one. Magazines are fascinating. Uh, there's, they go back, the old battle between the Federalists and the states' rights people go back to magazines as, as early as the first decade of the, of, the, of the 19th century. The first magazine published in Virginia was published by the name of Joseph Lyon, and he did that because his brother was prosecuted under this Alien and Sedition Act. And then in a, in another magazine called The Portfolio came out in 1810, and, uh, in, the, in the first decade of the, of the 19th century. And he was anti-Jeffersonian, and he, was, he published poems in the magazine about Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings. And it got to the point where they actually prosecuted the guy for sedition, but he was, he was, he was uh, not found guilty. So the, so the roots of the anti-slavery sentiment began in the early 1830s. Uh, that's an almanac, which is actually like by definition an annual, but it is a volume one, number one, that's why I collected it. Um, and there were two, there were two main focuses uh, at that time. There were the abolitionists who wanted to abolish slavery, and then there were the colonizationists who felt that they should start colonies in Africa and go back to Africa, and that's where the colony of Liberia came from. So there were journals of abolition, and journals of colonization, all of which are reflected in magazines. This is probably the most important abolished, early abolitionist publication published by a fellow by the name of William Lloyd Garrison called Liberator. Exceedingly important. Uh, and this was the number one movement uh, for, for, uh, for abolition. And it was published all the way through the Civil War. Samir. <laughs> Uh, refer to the magazine that I just bought. What I just bought, uh, I, I haven't been able to put it in the collection yet, is uh, a magazine by David Ruggles, who was, the, who was the first, who was a black abolitionist, who published the first magazine by an African American in April 1838. And he, he ran the Underground Railroad in, uh, in New York, and he, he was the one that brought Frederick Douglass out of slavery. There were two copies of that magazine in existence. One at the American Antiquarian Society in Worcester, Massachusetts. If you ever get there, it's fabulous. You should go see it. Everything before 1876 is in Worcester. And the other copies are in my collection now. That's why I have to buy it. Um, and of course, then Douglas went on. Since, 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 since Ruggles was a publisher, and, 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 he was, and he was idolized by Frederick Douglass, Douglas went into publishing, and he published his own news, a number of newspapers, Frederick Douglass's paper, the, the one called the North Star, which is his publication. He publishes with another fellow who was very fascinating by the name of Martin Robinson Delaney. Delaney, I, I like to think that, uh, that Frederick Douglass was sort of like the Martin Luther King of the 1850s. Well, Frederick, oh, Martin, Martin Robinson Delaney, if you haven't heard of him, he was the Malcolm X. <laughs> Delaney actually, in 1850, a black man, graduated from Harvard Medical School. And uh, he, he was a colonizationist, but he was also the co-editor of, of the North Star with Frederick Douglass. And then he also edited this magazine called the Anglo African Magazine, and he published the first novel by a black man in America. And of course, <coughs> Unfortunately, this is the this is the counterpoint. This is the South. This is a magazine published in in, uh, in Alabama in 1858, and you can see the the, the logo on the bottom uh, tells the, tells everything you want to know: the Negro, the bail, and the rail. Uh, of course, the magazine that started the Civil War was this one. It was an abolitionist magazine published by John Greenleaf Whittier called The National Hero. And he published the story by Harriet Beecher Stowe over a number of issues 
uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin, and this was, of course, the nidus for, for the war. And this, this drove the Civil War more than any other publication. Uh, during, the, during the Civil War, there were, there were northern magazines and there were southern magazines. The most important northern magazine was Harper's Weekly. Uh, Harper's, uh, <laughs> interestingly, Harper Brothers started publishing Harper's Magazine, which is still around. You can, you can pick up a copy of Harper's. It began in 1850. The mayor uh, of who, who, uh, New York in 1845 uh, became one of the publishers of Harper's Magazine. But in 1845, he ran on a very nativist program. He was a, he was a real bad guy. Uh, there was a party called the Know Nothings. I don't know if you're familiar with the Know Nothings. But the Know Nothings, there was something called the Whig Party, and the Know Nothings were strict, strict uh, um, racists, anti-Catholic, anti-black, anti-everything, um, sort of reminiscent of what, we, what we're seeing today. And uh, they destroyed the Whig Party, and out of the Whig Party came the Republican Party, and out of the Republican Party came Abraham Lincoln. This, mag this particular portrait of Lincoln, which is extremely flattering, was uh, at, a, at a speech given at Cooper Union in New York. Uh, this, this magazine did a lot, this image did a lot to get, get, get a beardless uh, Abraham Lincoln elected president of the United States. <coughs> Harper's has a very wonderful record of illustrations during the war. This is probably the most famous of, of the wartime illustrations. It's called The Sharpshooter, and it was, and it was engraved uh, by a fellow by the name of Winslow Homer. Homer is famous for his seascapes, but he was really a war correspondent. And he, he illustrated uh, war magazines a lot. And that mag that's the most famous illustration, the war illustration called The Sharpshooter. Uh, the other was, a, was a, a magazine called Frank Leslie's. It's a little harder to find. And of course, this is how Lincoln's assassination was pictured uh, in, in the magazine. These are two weeks apart. The one on the left is uh, Booth jumping off the uh, onto the stage where he fractured his ankle and made the famous uh, six December Tyrannus speech, and then the one on the right shows him at, at the time of the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. Uh, there were a number of uh, magazines published during the war, um, well, probably a dozen or so. Most of them on the northern side. Uh, they were associated with raising money. The, the, those days, in order to raise money for health, they, they had held what's called sanitary fairs. And there were magazines published at the various sanitary fairs in order to support the Union troops. <laughs> this is a wonderful little magazine uh, called Bruton's Monthly Planet Reader. And there you see the horoscope of Abraham Lincoln. I'm not, I'm not a big horoscope guy, but they, this did last until 1865. And the March issue did say, uh, it's going to be a bad month for the president. He may be assassinated. So they actually predicted his assassination by his horoscope. Um, this is rather amazing. Now, they, now, of course, on the other side, there are Confederate magazines. This is a very rare but important. That is the, that is the seal of the Confederacy, the record of news, history, and literature. And the front page article is a letter about General Lee's official report of the Pennsylvania campaign, or how I lost Gettysburg. <laughs> <laughs> Now, the North, the North had Harper's Weekly, the, the, the South had Southern Illustrated News, which was published in Richmond. That's the one on the, the, one on the left is, is, is Vicksburg, which is not far from here. Um, and that's the only city view you, you ever saw, ever, ever seen in a Southern magazine. The man on the right is General Longstreet, who was the Confederate general, general who uh, was defeated at Gettysburg. That's the first issue on the bottom, scarce wear. That's a beardless uh, Stonewall Jackson. <laughs> After the, uh, this is another published Confederate imprint, published right here in Memphis in 1861. Uh, and after the war, uh, General A.P. Hill's brother, General D.H. Hill, published his magazine in North Carolina, All the Land We Love. Now, all, all magazines published in the North were not pro-North. The Copperheads have a number of magazines. The Copperheads are North Southern synthesizers in New York. And these two magazines, The Old Guard, published in New York, 
and Weekly Southern Spy published in Baltimore. I mean, Maryland wasn't was a union state. These are Copperhead magazines. These are Southern sympathizing magazines. This one was suppressed for a while and then republished. So even during the, the depths of the Civil War, there were anti there were anti northern sentiment magazines being published in New York. After the war, uh, there was a there was a spirit of reconciliation. And these, these were published in the 1880s and 1890s. Uh, and then there was a very frank, let's get together and do it again. And this, this, this is, these are northern, but after a while it was blue and gray, fraternity union now and forever, off to war. And even, even the, these are dime novels, which was, it's sort of, there's a continuum of American popular culture. Dime novels began in 1860. That's what people read. They were issued in the hundreds of thousands. And they were, they were inexpensive. And this is how people got their news. And, and then, then the pulp magazines came in in about 1895. And they lasted until about 1930. And then the, then the comic books came in. Then radio came in. Then television came in. So there's a whole continuum of how Americans got their popular culture. The next war is, is, is really the journalists' war. Uh, the Spanish-American War. This is a very important magazine called The Yellow Kid. This is a wonderful story of two competing publishers, William Randolph Hearst and Joseph Pulitzer. And each of them had a newspaper in New York. And they commissioned an artist by the name of Richard Alcolt, R.F. Alcolt, to take this character by the name of which he called The Yellow Kid. And they would publish these sensationalistic magazines using the Yellow Kid. And they got into competition with each other to see who would be the most sensationalist of all. And because of that, sensationalist journalism is now called Yellow Journalism because of that man, because of the Yellow Kid, because of Richard Alcott. Now, here, here's, a, here's a wonderful magazine. This is, that's Hearst as the Yellow Kid in a magazine in Cuba. Now, there's a great story about Hearst. Uh, it may be apocryphal, but it's a really great story. Um, he wanted to get some news of, of the war in Cuba. So he sent a very famous artist by the name of Frederick Remington. You know, Remington, he was famous for his, for his, 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 his Indian portraits and his portraits of soldiers and statues. So he sent Remington to Cuba, and he says, Mr. Remington, I want you to go to Cuba, and I want you to get me pictures of the war. So Remington writes back, Mr. Hearst, there is no war. <laughs> so Hearst writes back, you furnish the pictures, I'll furnish the war. Um, and these are War of 18, these are uh, 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 Spanish American War magazines. That's actually the first magazine published by an, uh, outside of America by the military, published actually in the Philippines in 1898, the Soldier's Letter. And of course, this by now you can see that they have this color illustration, which came in about ten years before this. And the engraving is wonderful, and the graphics are wonderful. And you see, remember the main. So this is really the journalists' war. Let's get to World War One. This is probably the most famous military image ever. <laughs> it's the cover of a lot of things. I, I see that there's one. There's a so somebody selling houses down there. I, I saw that. We want you for our house. Um, it was actually published uh, by uh, the artist James Montgomery Flagg, a very famous artist. And he actually had this uniform, and he actually, he, he actually went to parties in it. He had this made for himself and he gave Uncle Sam. And yeah, so the first time it appeared was before the war. Are you, do, what are you doing for preparedness? Then when the war came out, they, 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 they republished it under the I Want You, which became the poster the famous poster. The poster actually is after the magazine. So if you look at the original poster, the point on the bottom is copyright unless the judge incorporated, incorporated because it came from that magazine. But like illustrators often do, he had borrowed the image. That's Lord Kitchener on the bottom. That had been published much earlier uh, from, in British magazine. So illustrators tend to borrow from each other. <laughs> and, and indeed, Flagg borrowed from Kitchener, uh, from, uh, from um, the Kitchener image. So there's, these are World War I magazines. There's, there's a remarkable amount of pro-German World War I magazines. A lot of them are printed in German. Um, this is, these are some of the earliest magazines published by one of the great iconic American artists, Norman Rockwell, who uh, spent, his, 
Lincoln's his war in Charleston, South Carolina. He, he was famous that fought the Battle of Charleston. Um, and, but he, he, he made these wonderful images on postcards and magazines, and he did a lot to, uh, to promote uh, American patriotism during the war. You'll see the title on the bottom of the third magazine is Over There, which was the anthem, really the anthem of American uh, of songs of, of World War I. And of course, we talked about British magazines. This was Bull. This was an anti-British magazine published during the, during the during the World War One, and this is my favorite cover of uh, Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, there's a long magazine, a uh, long running magazine called North American War Weekly, Harvey's War Weekly. That has this has the best images throughout the entire history of World War One. And then after the war, the pulp magazines came up. Pulp magazines are published on chip, uh, cheap paper. They're, they're made in a very, uh, place where they're usually a glossy cover, and they wanted to capitalize on popular culture. And here we are with war images published. These are published in the twenties, but it was very romantic to publish about over the top and under fire, flying aces, airplane stories. This is my favorite Zeppelin stories. <laughs> Now, leading up to World War II, uh, even in the 30s, um, there was a lot of anti-German sentiment. And this the, the movie on the right was Charlie Chaplin's famous portrayal. Yes. Yes. Um, you moved it some fair quality color. Yes. You know the printing process? Was it letterpress in those days? I couldn't, I couldn't answer that question. Okay. I couldn't Thank answer you. that question. Um, but Charlie Chaplin's uh, movie, the, Dic the Great Dictator, was one of the great uh, uh, anti-German films. And there he is, as Adolf Hitler. And this magazine was published in New York Life, Truth or, uh, The Truth About uh, Hitler, Man or Beast, What Is He? This was published in 1933. So they, they're proposed by some radicals, and then radical Samuel Untermeyer, but it turned out that he really was a beast. Um, now, in 1942, during the war, the Magazine Publishers Association uh, wanted to do their thing for patriotism, and they, they started a program called United We Stand Campaign, where every magazine in America published in July 1942 had a flag on it. And they were doing this to raise money for the war bonds. Now, I have about 500 different titles. Uh, the Smithsonian has the best collection. There were a thousand different magazines that had flags on the cover in July of 1942. And it raised a lot of money. Here's some more of them. My, one of my favorite ones on top is, is the ring in the middle. You never see a white man and a black man together on a magazine. It, the war superseded that. And of course, the man who superseded race in World War II was Joe Lewis. And there was a famous poster of him, a very famous poster of him saying, we will win because God is on our side. But Lewis broke the color barrier during the war. And even, even when the army was still integrated, they, Lewis and that's Billy Kahn on the left there that had a famous fight. And he, 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 he absolutely superseded uh, race. And even you know, Walt Disney got into the act. There's some more. Uh, Harper's Bazaar, comics, Captain Marvel, House and Garden. This actually won the prize for the, 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 the was a prize for graphics, and that won the graphic prize. House and Garden, not my favorite, but it's a nice magazine. This Harper's Bazaar still being published. Good housekeeping. There's Better Homes and Gardens as well that I don't have. I don't think I have it here. House Beautiful, look. And then there were some more graphics. There's a anti-war magazine, obviously, with somebody being hung on the front cover. That was published for the, uh, for the troops. That's the European edition. This is my favorite. <laughs> this, this is, this is uh, Edgar Bergen and Charlie McCarthy. You know, and it's, it's pinned the tail on the Hitler. Uh, here's a new poker game, and hang, hang the donkey schloss, or donkey blindfold into players, so you can you can their toil on their proper spot. <laughs> the fur a furious fun for all on the wall, and after the come closest to pinning, either get a shot or put in a concentration camp. 
This is a fabulous. This is fascinating. The, the, the Walt Disney Studios. There was a very famous cartoon which was suppressed later on after the war called "The Fuhrer's Face," and it was Donald Duck in an, uh, as a, in an anti-Nazi cartoon. And the theme of, of the cartoon was uh, Donald Duck throwing a tomato in, in, in Adolf Hitler's eye. And um, what they did was, in the Disney Studios, they, they kept a record of all the soldiers that were fighting in, in Europe who had been Disney employees. And they sent the magazine to them. Now, what they also sent them was something for their locker. <laughs> inside. And you'll see here, you see naked girls, you see uh, naked children. This would not pass muster today. <laughs> and, and, and in fact, and in fact, the Disney Disney Studios sent this to all of their former employees who were fighting in Europe. There's a copy of this in the Disney Family Museum, but they don't show the centerfold. <laughs> and of course, Norman Rockwell got into the got into the act with his famous Rosie the Riveter. This is based on Michelangelo family. You can see that she's standing on Mein Kampf. The original of this is actually in, uh, uh, in Arkansas at the Walmart Family Museum. Crystal Vision. That's the original. And, and what, 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 the, what, the, what the, the Oracle's famous for the Saturday Evening Post, what they actually did was they published what's called Pony Edition, but they wanted to save paper. So they took small issues of magazines and they shipped them to the soldiers in Europe, but not the large ones. They, and this, these are some of the some of the some of the uh, remarkable images. He had created a GI by the name of Willie Gillis, who was his typical soldier, and these are Willie Gillis covers. Rockwell is, is the with, his association with the Post started in 1916 and ended in 1963. It's the longest association of an illustrator with a magazine in American history. And of course, at the end of the war, the famous Iwo. Uh, flag racing. This, this was from the Stars and Stripes, which was radioed from EO through numerous sources and published, and then eventually it wound up on the cover of the U.S. Cameron magazine. They couldn't even figure out who the people were for a number of years, but now I think it's pretty clear who was there. And of course, this famous image of, uh, was in Life magazine. Yeah. Alfred Eisenstein. Uh, and both of them recently died. Uh, I think the, the, the soldier just died about two years ago. And, 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 and the woman who was a nurse, she died about 10 years ago. It's funny, I'm talking about WikiLeaks. <laughs> this magazine, there was a whole scandal over that particular magazine called Amerasia. Um, they had, uh, the Russians <laughs> had broken into um, the uh, publishers of this magazine, and one of the guys from the CIA had written a position paper on, 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 on the Middle East, a top secret uh, on the Far East, well, actually on, on, on on Indochina, and he's reading this magazine, he says, holy mackerel, this is the top secret stuff that I just broke. <laughs> so they raided the magazine and they arrested the publisher. So this was, this was really, the Amerasia was really the WikiLeaks of uh, World War II. Then we get to uh, Korean War, which, or Korean conflict. There really are no iconic images coming from the Korean War, but I, I chose this because these are people in their foils. Of course, the one on the, 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 one on the image on the upper right is the infamous Joseph McCarthy uh, of the uh, House Under Un American Activities Committee and uh, the, the Red Baker. And his foil was on the left, on the cover of Time, was uh, Edward R. Murrow. And it was really Murrow who, who, who broke McCarthy. Um, and of course, on the right is General Douglas McCarthy, who was a famous war hero, but he wanted to do things that, that uh, President Truman didn't want him to do. And uh, so I put MacArthur on the right and his foil, Harry Truman, who we called him. The center is George Marshall, and Marshall, of course, was famous for the Marshall Plan, among other things. He was probably the greatest general of World War II, though people don't really think so, don't appreciate that, but he was a strategist. He was the one that made people, Eisenhower worked for him. <laughs> Patton worked for him. He was the strategist. His, uh, his, his, his no, couple, couple of very good books coming out on Marshall, and his, um, his uh, museum is in, uh, in Virginia. And actually, I think, um, I was at, I was at um, Delta State the other day, and there's a plaque there where the Marshall Plan was actually first, uh, first founded in, uh, in uh, Delta State. Now, during the Cold War, there was a, an interesting cultural exchange between Americans and, and, uh, and the Russians. So they permitted 
the Americans to publish a magazine in Cyrillic, in Russian, about the goodness of America, and, then, and that in exchange, the Russians published a magazine called USSR in America, telling how great it was to be in Russia, published in America. So this was, this was a cultural exchange. <laughs> this is sort of like publishing an Al-Qaeda magazine here. <laughs> then, then we get to Vietnam, where things changed a lot. <laughs> the covers become much more graphic. The, the one on the right is an interesting magazine called Rank. It was actually published for the soldiers in Vietnam. Uh, it was, it's actually a guide to the whorehouses of, 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 of Tokyo and New York. So inside these advertisements for, for, for how to take your liberty in, 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 in Tokyo during Tokyo, the Vietnam War. But this was published in, in Vietnam. And uh, obviously the one on the left is a lot more graphic than you would see before. Now magazines have some immediacy to them, but this is an interesting, uh, this is called a pull off the press issue. In uh, April of 1968, a very famous, uh, I, I remember it, I don't know how people would remember this, but Johnson got up and said, I will not run, or, or, or and, if I'm, and I, uh, I will not accept the nomination for president. And of course, this made the cover of Life magazine. Those days, Life magazine, to be on the cover of Life magazine was the, the epitome of, of fame. Uh, and then, the same week, Martin Luther King was assassinated. So they, they pulled all the magazines they had left, that they had not distributed, and reissued the magazine as a memorial to Martin Luther King. You can see they both have the same date. Probably the most famous pull off the press issue, there's is only about 10 or 15 copies of it in existence, was uh, in late November of 1963, there was a plan that Life magazine was supposed to have uh, the, the famous football player Roger Staubach on the cover. And they had printed the entire run of the magazine. It's ready to go out. Not a single magazine was circulated. And lo and behold, the Aubrey Oswald killed John Kennedy. So they pulled the entire run of the magazine. But they ripped them all apart, saved the advertising pages, and reprinted an entire new magazine. And no magazines, no issues ever got out to the press, right? to the public. About five or six or seven of the editors saved souvenir copies, and I happen to have one of them. So, uh, which is, uh, that's, that's the rarest of the life magazines. And also, this is, they, they did this more than once, and here's, here's, here's a, a very unusual issue of an orangutan on the cover, but then they got this very provocative picture of, uh, of a Vietnamese girl with one leg, so they, they pulled off the, uh, the, the orangutan and they put in the one-legged girl instead for circulation purposes and for editorial purposes. And that's really all I have to say about one magazines. Um, now, I'll be happy to answer any questions you have about periodical. There are also a couple other things. Um, I have a book here which has this lecture in it. I have about I don't know, 18 copies. So for 18 people who want it, I'll be happy to sign it for you. You can take them home with you. Uh, it has a number of other uh, wonderful images from my entire collection. You get a good idea of what's going on. My website is AmericanMagazineCollection.com. I'm also having an ex exhibition at the Rollier Club in New York, which is a, a, bit of a bibliophile club, and a, in September 2020, which is going to be the, sort of the coming out party for magazines in my collection. I'd love to hear some people's ideas about what to put in it. Uh, I have to take 83,000 magazines and make it into 150 and tell the story of America. <laughs> uh, but uh, the magazine, the collection, the, the exhibition is, is going to be called Magazines and the American Experience, and I hope it's going to be sort of a coming out party for with the greatness of the American periodicals, which I love so much. Thank you very much.